hello everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming. And um, this is our third uh, district council town hall meeting that the city has conducted this year. Uh, because of budget constraints, um, we decided to combine districts for our town hall meetings. Um, we did one for districts one and two at the uh, senior community center. Um, and then we also hosted one uh, for districts three and four, which is sort of on the other side of town, down at the Marina Community Center. And now here we are with districts five and six, um, which sort of spreads from the west side all the way up to the north side. Uh, so we thought this would be the most central location to have our meeting. And um, we really value your input. We value your questions. Um, we're going to go for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, just so I just want to be clear as to the time frame on this. We hope that we can answer every question tonight. If um, And there may be some that are very specific that we'll need to follow up with you on. You can certainly um, leave us you know, your information to get back to you on, on any matter. Um, let me introduce Kathy Arnaus, our community relations representative. Kathy is our public liaison and um, Know, and she knows everything there is to know, thank God, because I'm the new kid on the block still. Uh, but Kathy uh, can, is a wealth of information. She can also get you to the right person at City Hall, too, to get answers for your questions. Um, so um, the one thing I'd like to highlight just at the beginning here is that the city is trying very much to expand and improve its communications efforts. I encourage you to take a look at the city website. There's a section within it in terms of, it's called you know, the contact the city, that's um, a section there called the e-notify, which allows you to sign up for information from the city and will come to you automatically as an email message. And you can sign up for everything or you can pick specific topics of interest to you, like you know events hosted by the Recreation and Parks Department or events for seniors or you know city press releases. Um, a couple of the things that we're doing this year that are new is that we have a monthly community newsletter that's distributed by email and is on the website. You can sign up for that for it there. You know, the city used to have a quarterly newsletter that was sent out in the mail and then eventually was put with the San Leandro Times. And given our budget situation, the print costs and the mailing costs were very expensive. But that isn't a reason though not to communicate. And I recognize that not everyone has access to the internet or email, but certainly a large number do, and we want to continue to communicate, and for the time being, that is the most cost-efficient way of doing so. Um, and so you can sign up for that. Um, there's, there's a lot of other information we have. Our community development department, which handles business development, housing issues, they have their own monthly newsletter, which you can sign up for. Our police department is putting out a quarterly newsletter. Um, and so there's there's lots of vehicles for you to get information about what's happening in the city. To frankly know as much as the city council knows, uh, because there's even a weekly update from the city manager, which used to only go to the council members and a few folks in town. Well, that's now on the website, and again, you can you can go and log onto the website and read it there, or you can sign up with the e-notify system and get it directly into your email box. We're trying to make our city hall as transparent as possible and reaching out and communicating at the same time you know we want to listen and hear what you have to say um, you may or may not be aware that city council meetings are now recorded and streamed online as they occur in audio format someday I hope that we'll be able to have it in video format but th there's a considerable expense involved in terms of redoing essentially the city council chambers and that's not an expense that we can afford at this time. But you can, you know, we welcome you to come to our city council meetings. You can also sit at home and listen to it through your computer. Or if you can't listen to it that night, the files are posted. Each one is an audio file. You just click on it and you can listen to it at your leisure later. We're also working on posting audio files of our city commission meetings, starting with the planning commission and the board of zoning adjustments and also city council committees. The city council has a number of committees, including the rules committee and the finance committee, etc. And lots of important decisions occur both 
by our commissioners and at the council committee level too. But it's all part of just, again, creating transparency, opening up City Hall as much as possible, trying to engage the community. I'm very much interested in your feedback tonight as to, you know, what type of job are we doing? How can we do it better? Um, you know, we're committed to taking in what you tell us and working to improve our organization. So thank you again. And I'd like to introduce your two council members, uh, council member Pauline Cutter and council member Jim Crowla. And we'll uh, start with uh, council member uh, Cutter. your council person, and Jim and I are looking forward to this meeting to be able to listen to your concerns and get answers to questions you might have, and also we're having two presentations that we learned from. Um, I was going to do a brief review of my first year, and um, now it's even going to be briefer, because I know really what we want to do is listen to your concerns and also hear from our police department and our um, traffic engineers. But the one thing I did want to highlight was something that was in it originated in um, District 5, but it's actually a citywide um, problem or event, and it has to do with our infrastructure, sewers, and mains. And what happened was um, the concerns were brought by District 5, but they were important to each resident in the city because our infrastructure is aging. And as it aging, it ages, uh, problems come up, and most times they're able to be fixed with no um, problem to residents. Sometimes, in the case that just happened with nine residents, the sewer main was broken and homes were built over the main so it couldn't be repaired. So the city uh, took it upon itself to put a new sewer in down Beverly to serve these residents. And it used to be that any um, lateral that you had from your home to the street was paid for by the individual homeowner. Um, but because the question came up, their laterals didn't fail, the city moved the sewer. Um, it became something that a topic in our city that we talked about at council level. Um, and we know that there's probably about 500 properties that may or may not have this problem in the citywide. So, and they're not all in District 5, some are in District 6 and 4, and so forth. So, there's a map actually on our website if you want to see. And because these areas are highlighted, it's just an older area it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a problem. But what this resolution, and in fact you've probably got your ballots at home right now, does is it evens out the cost for those homeowners. Um, what we did was find that um, we, let's see, where am I? Um, we wanted to put this out to the whole city to vote because it's going to be perhaps affecting different people all around the city. And what will happen is we, about two years ago, the price of sewers um, maintenance went up as a tax, and it's already in effect, and the city staff estimated that within that money already, there will be enough to make these repairs, so we won't have to raise taxes further for that. So I think that, that was one area that was important to District 5, and it ended up being important to the whole city. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jim Perlin. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Prola. I'm the uh, councilman from uh, District 6, which is around the marina area. Um, I just want to welcome all of you here tonight, and I want to tell you one of the reasons that we're having these combined meetings is because it saves a lot of staff time and it also saves the city some money, and especially in these recessionary times. I think it's, it's smart. Uh, I welcome everybody from District 5, District 6, and everybody else from the city that uh, uh, many have just come because they saw the flyer. Um, I know you want to hear the reports from the police department and engineering, and, uh, and they will take and answer all your questions. Um, and also, I want to remind everybody, please pick up this red card. It's on the back table back there. And it has the emergency numbers. It has the regular numbers. It has uh, fire prevention. It has animal control. It has community compliance. I hear a lot about community compliance. Uh, there is a way you can actually go on our web website, sanlandro.org, and uh, file a complaint if, uh, 
you see a house that's unkempt or the weeds are over 24 inches high or or there's furniture there's storm furniture out in front or whatever you feel is uh, is not um, uh, or is violating uh, the community compliance laws um, and you can find those on our website also um, also there's a um, uh, the community relations representative, which is Kathy Ornelas, uh, we call her our miracle worker. Uh, she's been working for the city quite a while now. She started with the police department, uh, and she knows far more probably than all the council members put together because she's really an expert in handling tough situations or getting you to the person that can handle those situations. So thank you very much for coming here tonight. Uh, I really want to hear what you have to say. And um, I'll turn this back over to our mayor. Thanks, Jim. And I, I just realized when I was talking about a city website, I didn't give the most important piece of information, which is what is the uh, URL or domain name? It is sanleandro.org. Um, the city used to have like a, you know, like it was like CA, CI, San Leandro, whatever. It's much simpler now. Just www.sanleandro.org. You're right there. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Captain Blue from our police department. And we're going to give at least 30 minutes um, for uh, the presentation, but also for your questions. So there's a good vigorous amount of time that we'll have um, for you to talk about public safety, crime issues that you're concerned about. No, that's great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, it's my great pleasure to represent Chief Spagnoli, who had other commitment, could not be here tonight, but I actually asked to come tonight. I was allowed to come whether I was representing the police department or not because I live in District 6. So this is important to me as well. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. We have a slide presentation for you. I was going to run through it. We, I did not intend on spending 30 minutes here tonight uh, addressing uh, the crime issues, but we certainly can. I have a bunch of experts in the back that their ear is a lot closer to the ground on the day-to-day -day operations of, of the crime in your neighborhoods. Uh, I pay attention to it, but uh, Officer DeGrano, who's here with us, will really know a lot. Many of you know him. He's our neighborhood watch and crime prevention specialist for the police department. And we have some others that I'll introduce in just a minute. But a couple things I thought would be nice to talk about tonight. Uh, we're hoping that maybe we'll, you'll leave with a better overview of home and business security. We certainly want to put a plug in for our neighborhood watch. How many people are neighborhood watch members? Okay, only about six or seven. So that's a really good program. We have a crime-free business program, crime-free multi-housing program, and I know people are interested in that. They're, both programs are tremendously successful in reducing crime. Uh, National Night Out, we just had that on August 2nd. Many of you participated in that. Saw some of us, saw some of our firefighters and our city officials. Uh, with crime mapping, uh, many people, you may not know this, but you can actually go to this website, www.crimereports.com. Do people know about that website? And you can look and see which crimes have occurred in your neighborhood. You can type in your address, you can type in an area, and it will show you within us, whatever, whatever distance you, you set, it will show you what's happened and put little pins on a map of different types of crime. Uh, but we have something that's even more specific than that. We're really excited. We just launched this last month. Our daily activity log on the website. On our web, if you go to the police department page, there's a blue button that says daily activity log. You can click there. You can look at calls that we are on, that we are currently on. Or you can look back 30 days at any call that we've gone to that isn't excluded. Some calls are excluded by law. Some medical calls, some uh, uh, mentally um, ill people, or, or if there's a a health issue or something that we can't put into the public domain, we don't. But you can see, if you see a cop car parked on the street and they're at, an, at someone's house or some area, you can look at it, it'll show by the hundred block the type of call that we're on. Uh, it's really exciting, it's real time, you can also print that report out. How many people did, uh, did not know that we just launched that? We're going to, okay, we're having Coffee with the Cops, which is another program, and it's coming up, and we're actually going to showcase that. We're hoping we're going to bring some, some computers that have web access, and we're going to show people how we can navigate through that and how it's a really powerful tool if you want to know what the police department is doing. We also recently had a Citizens Police Academy. It comes about in April or May. I think it's April or May. We're going to start that again. The process will start taking applications. If there's always more people that want to take, that want to be involved in that than we have room. We only have, I think, 20 or 24 seats. But we do take applications. We'd love to see citizens put in for that. It's a, a, a program that sh kind of showcases the different things that we do at the police department. At the end, you have, there's a nice graduation gift certificate. 
This year we expanded that to a teen police academy. In the summer we did a little bit of a different version, certainly more hands-on. We had a bunch of, of teens come through the academy, which was, the, the subject matter was geared more towards teens. They started every academy with 15 to 20 minutes of PT. And I'm here to tell you, everyone in the police department heard them doing the PT outside. It was like the, the mini Marine Corps outside because they had to sound off. But the young people that went through that really, really loved it. There were some people the very first day said they were there because their parents made them be there. By the end of the academy, they all got something out of it. They were all proud. They were in the uniforms. They really had a very good experience. Coffee with the Cops, which is something that we've started recently. It's, a, it's an informal network. It's an informal opportunity for you to come see, meet with the chief, us, and members from different parts of the police department to address specific concerns. The next one is October 11th, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, at 8 a.m. at Dick's Restaurant. We also have online reporting. If you have, a, if you need to make a police report just for insurance purposes and you don't want to wait for a police officer to come to your house, you just want to file a report online, there are certain reports that you can file online. Um, the police activity and arrest log is coming. Where It's going to model just like our daily activity log where once a week we'll put in all the people that we've arrested that we can release to the public domain. And then there's also a Megan's Law link. Everyone knows Megan's Law about people that have to register as, as sex offenders. We want to talk a little bit about crime totals. I apologize, we're going to go through this really quickly. It's, it's small to see. Uh, year to date, our crime is up just a little bit. We actually have this broken down by council in a little while, and, and I think that Officer DeGrano will be better equipped to address your specific concerns. These only go through August of 2011. We, we, have, we would just be getting the staff the close of the year, or the close of the month for September, either yesterday, today, or tomorrow, and we, I haven't received them yet. And I'm usually one of the first people that gets them. So this is through August, but it does show the trend, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11. It looks like crime was, was down at almost an all-time low, low over the, for at least the past 30 years in 2010 for part one crimes. This year it's trending upward just a little bit. Crime tent is up a little bit in 2011 so far. Of course, that's the district map, and we're, we're here tonight, districts five and six, in case anybody's not clear. District five is the one in pink in the top right, and then, and then Mr. Polo's district. But I assume most of you know that because most of you live in probably district five or six. This is crime information in comparison by district. Uh, and what Officer DeGrano did is he broke this down. The average for these types of crimes, robbery, aggravated assault, simple assault, burglary, larceny, and auto theft. We don't look at numbers as much as we look at trends, especially at these meetings. So the average for all, if we take all the council districts and we average them, the average for robberies is 24. District 5 total is, is trending high. It's 35. District 6 is, is 18. It's a little bit lower. It stands to reason there's more pedestrian traffic on B5, I mean on District 5 than there is in District 6. This is a little more industrial at times, so you wouldn't expect to see, um, necessarily if you were a crime analyst, you wouldn't expect to see the same number of robberies, but you might see more burglaries. And if you look down, there are actually were more burglaries on District 6 than District 5. Uh, the average is 68, District 5 had 64, District 6 had 71 over that period. So Districts 5 and 6 are pretty much along the average with the exception of robberies a little higher in District 5, and we need your help. We need to partner with you to reduce robbery, and there's some things that we can do, and Officer DeGrano, Officer Kovach have a whole bunch of ideas. Uh, Officer Nelson is here from, the, from our TAC unit probably can speak to that too. Things that we can do to help mitigate our risk of being victims of robbery. The other one that's, uh, that's worth taking note of is District 6 auto thefts. If you live in Councilman Mr. Polo's district, District 6, the auto theft rate is a little bit higher than the average. The average is 67. District 5 had 67 year to date. District 6 had 89. But, uh, and and we're, you know, we're going to look at that and we're going to ask people living on District 6 if you have ideas for what we can do to uh, reduce the number of auto thefts that are occurring. I just went through those two slides basically and explained them. There's, uh, we have more information on our crime statistics or for crime prevention on our website, which is, as the mayor said, www.sanlander.org. You can go to the department tab, find the police department. I think most people have done that. Or you can go straight to the police department. But I would encourage you not to limit your looking at the Sanlander website just to the police department, because every single department has really, really good things on the website. Uh, it's just fun because it's updated quite frequently, too, so it's always fun to go back on the web and see what else has been added, see what else is going on. Kind of a quick overview PowerPoint slide. Um, I was going to invite Officer DeGrano up here because he's really the, the expert at, at probably questions that you have. And um, do we want to have the other officers come up? I think, uh, yeah, we, let's, yeah, we'll see what the questions are. Okay. I do want to introduce him as Officer DeGrano is getting ready. In the back, uh, starting at the, at the, well, I guess the closest to the clock, I would say that's one of our newer officers, Officer Brandon Kelso. He's here tonight representing the patrol, what patrol does. 
uh, in terms of working your district and trying to reduce crime. Next to him is Officer Nelson, another one of our veteran officers. He's in the tactical unit. And next to him is Officer Gill. Officer Gill also is one of our tactical officers and uh, senior officer at the police department as well. And then this is a uh, guy that I have the pleasure of working with every single day. Officer, and I've known him for a long time, we know each other, Officer DeGrano, who has his uh, ear to the ground closer than anybody I know in terms of crime, crime, ten, crime trends, crime prevention, and what you can do to help us in our partnership. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Captain Ballou. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tim DeGrano. Uh, some of you, I know a lot of the faces out here we've uh, met before in either meetings like this or in the Neighborhood Watch programs. Um, I, I realize that uh, a lot of times we're very busy. Uh, we either you know are going to school or businesses or uh, or just you know trying to make a living. So getting home and going to another meeting if you've had about five or six already, you know it's kind of a drag, and uh, we understand that. Um, but the catalyst for the whole thing is that you do get involved, and that's what helps us out. And I'm going to have these officers come out. How many of you know what the TAC unit is, or how many don't know what the TAC unit is? Okay, quite a few. So our uh, tactical unit, is, it's a TAC unit. What they are, they are from patrol. They augment patrol. So we have seven beats in our city, okay? And it's, our city's broken down into beats for the police department. They're not like the districts. So within those beats, you have an officer or two that are responsible for that beat during those shifts, 24 hours, seven days a week. They are responsible for taking the calls. When you call because you know someone stole your garden gnome from the porch, they are the ones that come out and take the report and investigate that crime. They do the preliminary investigation. If your car is stolen, same thing. Uh, if you notice something suspicious and you're calling, which is what we do, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And yeah. yeah, we call when we see something suspicious. Uh, you you typically get a beat officer. When we get a robbery in progress or just occurred, or an auto theft, or a burglary. One of these crimes has just occurred. It's a little difficult, we do it, but it's a little more difficult to have an officer that's already on a scene somewhere else to try and get over to that part of town or to that part of their area to investigate that crime and really catch somebody, because that's what it's all about, is we want to catch somebody. We have a TAC unit. So they do not have the beat responsibility per se. So they're not going call to call to call to take the reports. What they do is they augment patrol because they're able to go out of the city should we have to go investigate if we get a license plate that maybe comes back to another town. Or they're able to get out there with the equipment that they have and set up a perimeter quicker. Whatever it takes to get the job done and they really help us out. But the other thing that they do is with the intelligence. They're out there, they know all of the players or they try to. They know who's out there committing these crimes and they try and follow up on that. So their day just doesn't start at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they come in. They're working all the time. They're networking with other departments, Oakland, Hayward, the County Sheriff's Department. They're out there trying to find out exactly so that they can curb the crime and they can stop it before it happens if they can. So you've, they've already been introduced. So later, when, I, when I'm done here in about two minutes, uh, they'll be able to take your questions regarding anything that you have that was in progress or what it is that they do on a daily basis. So with that, there are some things in the back that I put down. There's one that's a uh, quarterly. The mayor mentioned that we put out a, uh, a quarterly newsletter. Inside that newsletter, and it's online, it's on the website, but we also have the hard copies that I put in the back as well. Uh, there's always something different in there. Sometimes it goes by the time of year. So for Christmas, uh, that time of year, the holidays, we're going to tell you to be a little more uh, observant as far as the shopping centers go, what, what, where you park your car and what you leave in the vehicle, things like that, little tips. This time, I think it has to do with fraud and uh, scams with uh, property and real estate, things like that. Uh, but they do have some good tips, and then they also have all the numbers uh, that were already mentioned uh, that you can contact us and get a hold of us. So, are there any questions? And we have a microphone. And we can bring a microphone down to you. Any questions? Go ahead. Anything at all. Except for like the 1956 World Series or something. <laughs> How about that? Yes, sir. Uh, this was several months ago. I uh, I got a fraudulent check in the mail. At least I suspicioned it was fraudulent. I called an officer, then an officer, I called the police department, and they sent an officer. He picked up the check, said, I'll give it to a detective. That's the last I ever heard of it. So my point being, if there is a point, is uh, I would, I think overall, when something occurs and is reported, 
that we get some feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Absolutely. Reporting something like that, if you were to call the officer, and the officer comes out, you call the department, the officer comes out and takes a check from you. If you're the victim of something, uh, let's say that that was actually a stolen check and it was your check. Was this a, one of those kind of a company type, you just gotten a check for 50 bucks, or, or was it actually made out and it's a, somebody's personal check? It was for $1,000 to me personally, but I'm a uh, somebody in Nigeria, I think. Okay. Well, and typically that's, you know, a lot of the, uh, they call them boiler rooms, they call them other things, this is where they come up with all these scams and they go after you either on the internet or through the, through the U.S. mail, uh, and they'll send you something like that. What you can do is if, you know, a day has passed or two and you're just kind of wondering about it, uh, be sure to always get the officer's name. When an officer comes out to your house, for whatever reason, just ask the name. If you can remember, you can jot it down. That way, if you do want to follow up, which you should have gotten, uh, but I'm not real sure on the particulars of it, but you can always call and say, hey, what happened with that? Or they'll give you the officer's email, or they'll give you the officer's voicemail, and you can just leave a message, hey, you know, this is Mr. Jones, I live at ABC 123 Street, and uh, I just want to know what happened. And they'll, they'll get back to you, and they'll let you know. If you're the victim of a crime, where something was taken from you, something was done to you, uh, certainly a report would be generated, and you would have been given a business card or a uh, pamphlet that would have your, uh, that have the case number on there and the officer's name, so that you can follow up if they don't. Does that answer kind of? Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh. As part of the um, policing factor, you get statistics that show, as you just, as you just did, it shows a lot of the um, types of events that occur. How closely do you work with um, the uh, department that um, has to do with uh, okaying fences and things like that? Do you, do you guys talk a lot together about, I'm sure you have suggestions uh, to the, I can't remember the name of the division. It's not police, but it has to do with licensing whether we can have uh, six foot tall fences or not. And so, you know, because you see what happens on the street, but they work with design and, and um, codes. So, does your input come in to say, hey, maybe we ought to consider that it's okay to have a six foot fence in this area? So that they have some input as so that you have some input as to, you know, ways to protect the community in general. And I mean that in a, the entire city. Well, I think what you're what you're speaking of would be our uh, we do have a unit uh, that goes out there, the code compliance unit. because uh, we have obviously our, our building codes, we have residential codes, municipal codes. Uh, you know, you have the weeds that are overgrown and you have a fence that's maybe an adjoining fence that is taller than what the city will allow normally. We have a unit that will go out uh, if you were to call and they will investigate it, photograph it, contact the owners. Um, they try not to cite right away if it was a misunderstanding, they just didn't realize, didn't get the permit. Is that, is that what you're talking about? That is not what I'm talking about. Oh, take, for instance. I take back what I said. Okay. On the Broadmoor on the broad corridor, okay, it's very dark there. Oh, there's one side of the street that has, I don't think, much lighting at all. Now, I don't know what the statistics are for robbery or, or theft or something. I know there's a lot of people that go around during the, um, um, before the, garbage pickup, and they, they bring their cars to stop and all that jazz. But the thing is, is that if you get stats and you look at it and you say, okay, this is what my, my team sees, okay, then maybe we ought to talk to uh, engineering or something like that and see if our input about what's happening on the streets can affect what they do on, on the um, physical plant of the, of the city. Like, we could really use better lighting, and I've been after that for years. Because I, but I haven't got the steps to prove it until now that you can, you know, show it. So I'm saying because you guys are out there pounding the pavement and looking at the stats, you could say, hey, um, planning, have you thought about? Because it might do something to save our citizens from having something that's happened to them. That's what I'm talking. Okay. About. 
So what happens is, when the officer goes out, if there was a robbery, and I'll let them uh, speak on that, uh, let's say in the Broadmoor Corridor, and it was near a uh, public area, like a bus stop or something like that, that probably isn't well lit. If they determine that that was a factor, it's going to be in the report. It's going to say that. Now, do we go and to the city and say, listen, I have a stack of reports, and it's all in this area, and it's probably because of the lighting. Um, we probably don't do that. Uh, only because there are other factors that are more relevant to the lighting at that time. Now, that being said, with burglaries and things like that uh, in a residential area, or even in a commercial area, myself or my partner, Kerry Kovacs, there's something called Community uh, Policing Through Environmental Design, SEPTE. And we will go out and we will kind of uh, showcase the property, and then we will explain to you where you should have, not by product, but just where you should have better lighting, where you should cut back the foliage, where you should have maybe uh, you know a different type of uh, lighting in the porchway or the driveway or something like that, uh, that would enable you to be a little safer uh, with that, you know, with that type of crime. Uh, but we do not, that I know of, uh, go out. We don't necessarily go out. However, through our informal outreach and our formal outreach through the crime prevention officer, through our coffee with the cops. I was in a meeting last week with two, two well, with one of our engineering people on one day, another one of our engineering people on the other day. So it, as that information uh, flows throughout the police department, we, we can talk about those things. The other thing I, I just wanted to mention is, and I, I know we have Citizens for San Leandro, Citizens for Safer San Leandro in here, and they started it up in, in District 5 where they thought that there was an area of town that they, in the residential that they needed more lighting, but there was plenty of lighting by code, so they all agreed to get motion detector lights and put them on their own homes on a certain street. So it's a true partnership between the police department and the community, and, the, and those motion lights do deter criminals that are gonna do burglaries. But if you have a specific area, then we need to know, we need to talk offline or after this meeting, and we'll, we'll evaluate it, and the officer will tell us, hey, they're right, you know, we need to do something about that lighting. And then public works and, and engineering, and also through your city council, um, you know, we can make some adjustments. There's crime prevention through environment, or environmental design, like Officer Grano said. But we we do tend to look at causative factors, but we also look at victimology. And sometimes it is a causative factor with lighting or with, you know traffic patterns or what have you. And then sometimes it's also victimology, which is what was the victim doing? And we look at that and see if we can also make the community aware of what's going on. And I think uh, Officer Ron probably has a bunch of examples that you probably have examples of the victimology side. So if you have something specifically that's out, you know, fencing or lighting or environmental design, let us know and we'll see what we can do. We won't always probably have an answer that's satisfactory for everyone because sometimes, you know, there's some sort of decision points that have to go in, but uh, we definitely want to work and sometimes we won't know unless you tell us, if that makes sense. We were in the neighborhoods, but we have a different perspective. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Craig Williams, and uh, um, I have sort of a question that's a little off the wall, but it's about consumer protection. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of, of what's called usury now in our society, where banks are charging excessive interest rates <laughs> on credit cards, and, you know, if you look at this, um, you know, as money leaving San Leandro, it might be as much as a half a million dollars a month, which is leaving the city. And, you know, this is, like I said, it's sort of an off the wall idea, but, um, you know, it might be something that the, the police department could work with the city and work with local citizens on. You know, people work collectively on this issue, uh, they can maybe get some sort of results on this. Um, so, um, you know, everything is negotiable with these banks in terms of credit cards. And it might even be something that could help improve the relationship between the police force and, and local citizens. So um, basically, you know, and also another point is that this money that leaves individuals in our city goes to banks, and, and for the most part, they're investing this money overseas. So it's bad for the local economy, and it's bad for the general economy. Um, so it's something that I wish you could uh, at least entertain and think about, uh, and uh, um, you know, it would be tremendously helpful to, especially the poorest people within the city. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if that was a question or not, but I, I get where you're going uh, with it. Um, unfortunately for us, and that is our, uh, I don't know if it's our Achilles heel or what, when it comes to situations like that, or, or that type of uh, uh, thought, is that 
Yes, we obviously, when the economy goes down, we do tend to pick up in other areas of crime, right? Uh, but I've said it before, those of you that have been at the meetings, don't be fooled by the fact that if the economy was flush, I'm here to tell you right now today that the people that are committing crimes today would be doing it and have been doing it when the economy is flush. That's just what they do. So the notion that it goes up, yes, it does a, a tad. Uh, people have to feed their families and whatnot, and so they may be more apt to do something that they wouldn't have normally done anyway. However, with getting involved with the banks and uh, trying to get them to do something else, it's probably out of our purview. Uh, in fact, I know it is. Um, however, if there is programs or are, if there are meetings or something like that, we're always available to come and do what we do. Other than that, I mean, there's not too much we can, can do. I ask yes. One quick thing: um, Do you have any numbers on uh, how much money uh, when you talk about robberies? Uh, you know, what, is there a, mo a money amount or a dollar amount on, in terms of what you estimate the robberies to be? I mean, you have numbers on how many robberies. You're speaking you of the loss. I mean, what, what was taken? Uh, that would be in the report, but it's not something that we would uh, categorize or something that we would look at as a statistic. Um, if a bank gets robbed and they take $1,000, or you get robbed on the street and they take $500, that will be in the report, but it's not something that we, we would you know, categorize. Um, so no, we do not. question I have, we have a neighbor that their car was stolen one night by two teenagers, and uh, our police department, I guess, caught them after they had wrecked the car and they have been waiting for some type of payment to replace the car and uh, the district attorney's office won't do anything for them and uh, I'm wondering what can they do now, your teenagers, what can they do now to get some type of... Well the money they'd be waiting for would obviously be through uh, the insurance company. It wasn't insured. It was oh, it was not insured? Old, it was a, to a Toyota. It was an older one that he used for transportation back and forth to park. And, uh, what happens in, this, in that case, and uh, you know, if, if they're arrested and they go through the judicial process and the case is adjudicated, uh, the, at that time the juvenile referee or the, the judge for juvenile court, which is where they go, um, would probably, you know, not only would they get probation or they'd get, you know, to spend some time in the jailhouse, uh, they would also have to make amends. However, you and I both know that they're juveniles. Uh, if they're out, you know, taking cars um, without somebody's permission, then they probably don't have two nickels to rub together to begin with, and they're probably not going to get, they're probably not going to get anything. They can contact the district. There are programs, uh, victim assistance and things like that. If that was a sole source of them getting to work or to and from the doctor's office or whatever, there are programs out there and they would have to research that on their own though, uh, through the DA's office. My name is Melissa Alvarasi and I'm with the Davis West Neighborhood Group. We have a lot of kids in our neighborhood that, um, that you know, get wrong bunches at when they don't have anything to do. And so lately we have a group of kids in, a, in, in the south, north side of the Davis Woods area where um, these kids don't have parents, they really care about them, and so they let them loose everywhere. So lately there's a lot of these kids that are, um, that are hurting elders in our neighborhood. They're being mean to our elders. And um, they, they disrupt a lot of things in the, in the neighborhood. So I'm wondering, in the old days, we used to have an officer that came around and you know walked the neighborhood with us and, or even did some, a little talking uh, at someone's house. And the kids were part of it. Uh, I know the budgets are really constrained right now, but we need to get kids to realize who you are and also um, give them some, some advice on how to be part of the neighborhood. But if they see you, they not only get scared from you, but they also can be your buddy and, and, and they need that. Do you still do these kind of programs? 
We have, uh, well, we just mentioned the Teen Academy. That was new for us this year. But we've always done school programs. Uh, I just went to a meeting two weeks ago with uh, the Police uh, Activities League. Uh, they have a junior leadership program. Uh, these are kids from all over the city. Uh, typically, they go to the high school, but they live all over the city. And uh, they get together, and they have guest speakers come out. They have business owners. Uh, so there was somebody from the bank the week before I was there. Uh, and then I went out. So we, we do that. Um, if it's in a home, uh, typically, like you know, you said the neighborhood. Typically, somebody will call and say, "Listen, you know, it's my son or my daughter and their friends, and I'd like you to, to talk with them." We're more than open for that. We're we're more than willing to do that. Uh, but on a large scale, getting a bunch of kids together, um, you know, all the programs that we have, all we can do is ask and and allow them to come to us and, and say, "Yeah, we'd like to be part of that program." And unfortunately, the attention that they do get is when they are committing these crimes or when they're just hanging out with no business at 2, 3 in the morning. They're going to get the attention of these folks here. Well, we used to have a beat cop that would come and be around these kids. And I would introduce them to some of these kids. And it used to work. You know, it's like it's something that um, I think on a weekend, if people are, not, if the officers are not too busy, we need to bring that back. We absolutely can. One of the things we have on the website when you go on is it will tell you who your beat officer is. It will have a way to contact him or her. And you can do that. So if you know who your beat officer is, then you could contact them and say, hey, listen, if you'd come by, I'd like to talk to you about this. And then maybe they can make time you know, to go do just what you're talking about. Uh, we're open to that and uh, more than willing to do that. So my second question is I've had um, thefts from where I work. And we had an officer come and take a report, but in, nobody ever followed up. Nobody ever, I mean, I, I really, when I see a failure of those who are taking the reports, but nobody ever follows up, even though I gave them all the records of everything that was happening, nobody ever followed up. So I'd like to see something proactive on that. And, and I see it happen a lot more than ever. So if you can give me some ideas on how do we work with you to make sure that we can protect the identity of, of, of the citizens here. Well, I'll tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to have Officer Gill come up and kind of explain to you when an officer comes out to take the initial report, remember I said this is a preliminary investigation. So they take all your information, the what happened, uh, and piece it together and write an initial report. <coughs> And then that goes to an investigator, our fraud investigator. And we have one for the entire city. Uh, so you can imagine what that desk is like. Identity theft is that's huge. It's a huge crime. It happens every day, all the time, multiple times. Uh, so that desk is, is huge. But you can always contact them. Uh, but I'm going to let him explain to you what happens after the officer comes out. Hello, I'm Officer Ryan Gill. Uh, as uh, Officer DeGrano was talking about, we'll come out as the patrol officer. We'll get all your information and list in the report, take a statement from you, find out, kind of try to track down where your identity ended up being stolen. And then we'll write a police report, collect all the evidence, and then at the end of our shift, we submit it to, uh, it's all computerized now, so it's really just submitted through the computers. And then a copy of your report is spit out onto the uh, desk, fraud investigator's desk. Well, financial crimes are kind of the <coughs> biggest crime in the nation right now. So you, you have to imagine that one fraud investigator's desk, as Officer DeGrano was talking about, it stacks up. In order to investigate one of those crimes, the, the fraud investigator actually has to contact, he's got to retrace the steps of whatever was taken, or whatever path your identity took before it was stolen. So he may have to contact four or five or six different financial institutions before they can get any investigative lead. And if he has, 10 reports and he's got to go to four or five different locations. I mean, he could be there all day just on the phone trying to do follow-up investigation in order to get the suspect to the root of the person who's stealing the identities. So as Officer Grano talked about, try to contact a fraud investigator. I've been in investigations, I did missing persons, or it's equally as difficult. And it's hard to follow up with people when you have a huge caseload. But when the phone rings, we're more than willing to pick up the phone and talk to you and try to look up your case. Unfortunately, it's, it's just, we spend so much time trying to get the suspect, sometimes we need to make time to actually talk back to the victims. So 
So I think we have uh, we have time for two more questions. Okay, I have a mic. They also last night. I have just a couple of them, or maybe thirty. Um, my big complaint here in San Leandro is this. I have mentioned I've mentioned this at meetings before. There are cars speeding everywhere. Honest to God. And you know, I, I even tried it out the other day. I thought, okay, now I'm gonna kind of speed up a little bit here. Let's see, how fast am I? I'm going 50, 55. There's not, I don't see you guys getting citations. I think you need to do this. This is revenue that the city needs. I think that the other benefit to this is that it will uh, keep down the crime. And I'd like to see you doing more of that. I mean, I don't speak, don't get me wrong, and I'm not gonna tell you <laughs> what kind of car I have and where I live, but I think you know. <laughs> I really and the think license number start, is? Uh, no, I'm not saying. But um, I think that you really need to start doing that. I, I really do. And that's a revenue enhancer. And that's something we can make some money on by, you know, tagging people that are speeding. And we have a lot of bikers here. We have a lot of walkers here. So, uh, you know, we have to be, uh, and we have to keep this crime down. And the other thing that I want to know, know about is the noise. Sometimes these boom boxes that are playing in their cars. I, I don't know if we have an ordinance or not. I think we might, but I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But that's something, too, I'd like to see, you know, some ticketing going out on that. And lastly, the thing I have to say that really I was very upset about what I read in the paper about the three murders that happened at that tattoo party. And my question to you is this. Do you know of these parties that they're, that they're going to be there? I don't know. I didn't read much about it other than uh, a little bit in the Times. But is there any way in which you can keep track of when they have these underground parties of any sort? Are there any permits that they have to take out? Because that, to me, was really terrible. And that's not the San Leandro I know. Uh, so I, that was upsetting to me. Thank okay. you. I'm going to defer that right over here to Captain Blue. I'd like to answer those in, in reverse order and start with the murder question and the question about the permits. Um, a lot of people, I, I'm not sure that people are aware, but these parties are underground parties. The people that throw these parties, they don't come to City Hall to pull a permit. They go to the businessman and they say, I'm having a party for 50 of my closest friends. It's a 50th birthday party. We need a space. I waited until the last minute. I was supposed to get something else that fell through. And I mean, I'm so desperate right now, I'll pay you cash. I, I, if, if we could just use it for one night, it'll be calm, there won't be alcohol served. And a lot of that's true, but the 50, 50 year old birthday party is not true. And so that's what they do. It's all underground. So there's no there's no permitting. They're not going to try and get a permit or pull permits or ask the business owner to pull permits. In fact, one of the things, one of the documents that we put together in crime prevention is how to avoid getting duped. And if you're interested in that, we're going to put it online because it's really coming up as a result of this, the tragic event. Um, and we are investigating that. And right now, all of our efforts are going to try to identify the, the, the individuals responsible for that. The um, the second question you asked was about noise and boombox. There's not only a municipal code and noise ordinance, but there's a vehicle code that specifically talks about music that can be heard from 50 feet or more away from the vehicle. And I can tell you our officers do cite for that, because it, 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 we take the same offense to some of that loud noise in neighborhoods and streets that you do. The third one is, I, I, there's not a street, I forget how many miles of roadway there are in San Leandro, Ken Joseph can tell us, but there aren't enough cops. I guarantee you, there are never enough cops to write that speeder who's speeding on our street, on my street. Uh, we do take it seriously. Our traffic officers work very hard. They write a tremendous number of citations to reduce accidents. But one of the biggest misunderstandings the public has about traffic tickets is that it's a revenue generator. They are not revenue generators for the city. The state and the county make about 90% of the fine. So if we write a ticket and the judge finds you guilty of about $400, the city gets 32 to $40. Well, I guess the other important part to that is that it will reduce crime. Yes, but we do have some crime, we do have some traffic thing, traffic mitigation strategies. Engineering will work with you if it's a specific street. I know they've done a lot in the Broadmoor neighborhood, and they've done a tremendous amount of work for Broadmoor. We also have radar trailers, which we can deploy. If it's a problem, we ask that you call us. If it's a certain time of day or night, our, our motorcycle officers, our traffic officers will go out there, they'll take, they'll, they'll enforce. The problem that we see is that a lot of times neighborhoods call and they want enforcement and everybody's speeding and then we get there and who are we citing? <laughs> the neighbors. <laughs> so, oh, I wish we didn't call. So, but if there's a specific street or specific problem that, that you want to address focused, limited enforcement, we can do that. Yeah. I, mean, I know that was a little bit of a long answer, but it was a three-part question. But it's question. on East 14th and it's on Bancroft and it's all over. Yes. It's on Davis. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. 
So, and I'm not even complaining about my street, so. No, I, I, I'm telling you, it's every street. I, it's on my street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, as a follow-up to the question on, on the underground parties, and this may not belong to you, it may be more appropriate for our city council and mayor to address, but legislatively, isn't there something that we can do? This is if you rent out anything, even if it's for someone's legitimate 50th birthday, that you have a permit, so at least you know where the activities are in the, in the city. Um, so that's, and I'll defer that question if someone else can answer it. But my uh, other question, the zoning department, and you ran this, the, your statistics relatively rapidly, so I may have missed it, but where do you count what I'm gonna call nuisance or a mad as hell crime. When someone comes out, we just had an incident where four car windows were shot out. Someone in the middle of the night, for no reason, just went through the avenue and shot them out. I've had my car broken into, uh, another window smashed. It's not life-threatening, it doesn't make me feel good. And I realize that, and I don't wanna waste your time. But I think my personal sense is, this type of crime is going up where I live. And, and I guess that's not considered, what you're talking about is not a part one crime, so it doesn't get posted with the part one crime statistics, which by the way are online as well, they're on the web. However, the crimes of significance, what we call the neighborhood felonies, it's maybe not a felony in the state, but it, it bothers you if you're a neighbor. Our beat officers, our beat cops, they make face-to-face -face relief. So if, if I'm going off duty and Officer Gill's going on duty, I'll tell them, hey, and we had this in the 400 block of Lewis, and hey, we had this. So there's this debriefing that goes on so that we can continue knowing what the problem areas of the hotspots are. We, at the police department, we can, we can look. We have tremendously powerful computer programs. Let me say that again, tremendously powerful. If you want to know how many barking dog calls we had in the four block area around your house in 2010, we can tell you. I mean, we have the capability, and so Officer DeGrano can help you with that kind of stuff. Those neighborhood felonies do get reported, even if no report's taken. We have to know about them, and then the officers will address that with each other in patrol, and we'll address it with our special units like crime prevention and more traffic uh, or uh, community compliance, so we can help you deal with that problem. And, and believe me, we, we know those are just as important as someone who's victimized by robbery, because it still impacts our quality of life. And we, and we know that. One of the reasons, personally, that I like to live here is because I know the San, I know from both sides, San Luis Oro takes those things seriously. And we do try to work with the neighborhoods to make sure that we can mitigate and take appropriate action in those. Um, and then the, and the mayor was going to address your other question. And then also, I think that ends the police department time, although Officer Rana will be sticking around and will be able to answer any questions you have after. So we do want to thank you for your attention and your, and your very well thought out intelligent questions. Thank you. Could you tell us what a part one crime is? Part one crime, part, the question is, can you tell us what a part one crime is? It comes from part one of the penal code. So I can tell you the ones that, that are measured by the Uniform Crime Reports FBI. It's burglary, robbery, arson, uh, mayhem, lewd and lascivious conduct, larceny, murder, and rape. Uh, Susan, in terms of answering your question, we're going to be looking at this closely of the city, because uh, there's a lot of complexity to it. I mean, there's, you know, a church might, you know, have a party in their, you know, uh, recreation room. They never go to the city for a permit. They're not required to. Um, and so we have to find, we, we have to look at our current landscape. I want to look at what some other cities are doing. I want to see, you know, can we change our ordinance to really laser focus in on this problem? I mean, with respect to the business that allegedly had the party that was at the event, and, and I'm just saying allegedly because facts haven't been truly, um, the investigation is still ongoing. But they had a permit to um, rent out um, trailers um, for vehicles. They, they did not have any permit whatsoever for holding parties or events. And, you know, we need, I want to look at our permitting process in terms of the enforcement side then. So if you you know if you have a permit for a particular use and you turn around and you know violate that permit um, and there's you know a tragedy, what is the appropriate response by the city? You know, should you lose your business license um, amongst other uh, possibilities? Um, and it's gonna take a little bit of time, but we're gonna thoroughly analyze it. This is you know, the second time in a sense that this has occurred, I, there was a, 
the facts were a bit different, but there was a shooting after a party at down at the Monarch Bay Golf Course about a year ago. Again, the facts are a little bit different, but the whole idea of sort of these underground parties promoted on Facebook, on Twitter, that um, all of a sudden, you know, instead of so to speak, you know, the owner is told, well, 50 people will be here, there's 200, there's 300, um, there's no security whatsoever, um, violence breaks out. You know, I don't want San Leandro to become that type of community, and we're going to work conscientiously on addressing that. Well, that was my point. It wasn't so much, I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not qualified to answer, but if there's some way you can work together so at least the police department would know that Monarch Bay is having a, quote, party. It's just awareness. Well, there is, there, there there is communication gone. between City Hall and the police department with respect to events where permits are taken out. Don't have any doubt about that. The problem you know, we're dealing with here is you know, these are unpermitted. You know, the, the building operator is not getting a permit, doesn't have a um, a license to allow this event to even occur in the first place. Okay. We're going to move to our um, the transportation side of the evening, but again, the police officers are in the back. We want to talk to them later, um, and um, we have our director of our engineering and facilities department, Luce Bumezway, here to speak to you, along with uh, two other individuals from this department, uh, Kevin Joseph and Keith Cook, and. You know, fire away at your questions. Okay, thanks. Good evening. Good evening. It's always nice to be introduced by the mayor because he's about the only person who can say my last name. <laughs> but uh, for the rest of you, you just call me Uche. I'm yeah. fine. Um, we do work very closely with the police, uh, like uh, the captain mentioned. Um, and for your information, we have about 180 miles of streets in San Diego, so that's a quite a bit of area to cover. <laughs> but one of the things that we do in, in, in uh, engineering, because we're so competitive, we found out that the police was bringing in teams, so we brought our own team as well. And the only difference <laughs> is that they have guns, so we don't. <laughs> but um, Good. <laughs> um, we, we do love doing these, uh, these events uh, for the community and talking to the community. Uh, because we really love this community. Three of us uh, that the mayor mentioned all live in San Diego. So we drive the same roads that you do. We, we travel to the same places that you do. We have the same experiences that you do. Uh, having said that, though, we still enjoy hearing from you uh, on issues that, that are particular to where you live. Because that's the only way we actually know. But when we find out, we do everything we can to address these issues. So, like I said, this community is very important to us. And we live here and we love it here. Um, this evening, uh, we're going to uh, do a presentation that uh, covers both engineering and transportation. We have a lot of projects that are going around in the city, uh, but we're just going to concentrate on those that are either in your community where you live, or your community, I mean your district, or things that we feel that will have an impact to you. So this evening we're going to cover a number of things. First, we'll talk about the street projects that we're doing. Uh, Ken just said he's going to do that. And then he'll talk about Eden Road. Uh, Eden Road, as you know, is actually the last dirt road in San Leandro. I don't know if anybody people knew that, but that's the last one that's left. And the city suddenly wants to develop it. Uh, it's very complicated uh, by a number of issues. One is that uh, it, it's part of it is in the city of uh, Oakland. <coughs> and, uh, uh, so getting that to happen is complicated. There's no funding, of course. And part of this funds are going to come from assessment districts, uh, which it's a very long process. So it's a very complicated project. But what we want to do is just to kind of give you a sense of where we are. So you, you, at least you are aware there's a project in the pipeline uh, for Eden Road. So we're not going to have a dirt road in San Diego anymore, uh, hopefully soon. And then we'll talk about the Marina Park course as well. And then there's something that's very important called the countywide transportation plan that has to do with, um, we do every number of years <coughs> to plan transportation in, in, in the county. Uh, it's important that we have good flowing transportation systems in the, in, in the county, but it's even more important that we have good flowing ones in San Diego. So what we, we try to do is to represent the interest of San Leandro when this county work plan is done. And the only way we can represent that interest is by knowing what you want, knowing what your needs are, so that when we start to provide input in the plan uh, at the county level, that we make sure that your interests are very well protected. Um, so Keith Cook, uh, who's a, a, a head of land use, which is in uh, private, private uh, development and transportation in San Leandro, will talk about, about that. And then also, he'll talk about the Kaiser Hospital. There's a, as you know, there's a hospital being built here. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, unfortunately, whenever you do construction, there's, there are always impacts. 
the proponents of the constru construction is happening within their site, but there are some elements of it where they're actually doing some road works, a uh, widening of Merced and fairway and, and uh, some intersections, which will have impact, and does have impact on, on traffic movement, and some of you may have experienced that already. So what Keith is going to do is give you some timelines that will help you understand what's going on there and, and know when to avoid uh, that area and when to be there. And of course, then we have the uh, HOP project, which is the additional one lane uh, and the freeway to, to uh, extend the HOP lane that's currently there. Keith will talk about that as well. And then, uh, lastly and not the least, we have a partner in AC Transit that we've done a number of things for, but one of the things that they're working on right now is uh, Bus Rapid Transit, the BRT as it's called. And uh, it's been a, a, a project that's been going on for a while uh, with them, and, and we have weighed in both as a, as a community and as a, as a city council uh, as to what they're doing. So he's going to quickly go through uh, what is happening with our project. So uh, I'll hand it over to Ken, who has to leave, uh, but he, he uh, is going to quickly go through his part of the presentation. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm Ken Joseph. I'm the city engineer here in town. Uh, like you said, we are better with the police department. When you're done looking at their website, come look at the engineering side of the website. We have lots of interesting things there, including a lot of projects that are going around it, all around town. We'll talk just about a couple of things that are going on specifically in, in Districts 5 and 6. Uh, we currently, just looking at, at uh, the uh, street reconstruction projects that are, that are currently ongoing, um, we have up in District 5 this year, we have um, uh, a couple of sections of the street that were reconstructing, uh, portions of Big Year, and then portions of Bancroft. I don't know if you've noticed in front of uh, Bancroft Middle School, there's been sort of the continuing running on Bancroft that's happening over actually over several years. It's actually uh, some settlement in the 1920 storm drain pipe. There's nothing wrong with the pipe, but it's 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 been settling over time. We'll go through and, and rectify that uh, that issue. Uh, and then in, in District Six. Uh, this actually, last year we started uh, doing something something new, which is a, a we, used to, we always used to do either we used to reconstruct the street or do something called slurry seal, which is um, sort of heavy paint with sand in it. This year, um, and it only, only fits certain kinds of streets. Last year we started a program where we're using something called a rubberized uh, uh, chip seal, which is uh, basically ground up tires. It's good for the environment and also adds life to streets where we couldn't necessarily actually get to um, those streets using a slurry steel kind of product. So this year we're, we're doing a number of, of uh, a lot more extended program than we were last year with when we did one street as a trial. Um, and most of that's occurring in District 6. Um, here's, here's a portion of it. Um, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the green, all the, the, the green streets that have already been done. Uh, we're not quite finished with the project. There's some uh, striping left to do and uh, some touch-up work, but uh, they'll be done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then we're also doing, we're actually just starting to work here on, uh, on several streets, you know, Pearson and Johnson Maria here, that will be reconstructed. We just can't use that kind of program uh, for those. It won't be fully reconstructed. And then you've probably seen the contractors out there uh, working on the concrete work, um, which is just getting started. And then down, you know, further down in, in six, we are actually covering uh, quite a bit of, uh, of District Six this year. It's in one of four maintenance areas, which is set up by Public Works. We see we uh, have divided the city into four uh, areas of about equal equal uh, pavement uh, street length. We go through and we do each. And we work by a specific heavily in a specific district each year. Uh, this year, um, the lines don't follow council districts. Uh, like the police needs to, but the uh, uh, but we'll do this area of District Six next year. Uh, we'll be we'll be looking in the District Five uh, area. We'll we'll be up, up for next year for this type of uh, treatment. Uh, something that's outside of of, uh, of the district, but uh, you know, will be uh, important because it's a major street is Marina Boulevard here between Tea Garden and Alvarado. Um, is having some work done with a federal grant that, we're, uh, uh, that we've received. It's basically night work. We're not, we're not completely reconstructing the street, we're just removing four inches of asphalt, putting four inches back in. You'll see that. Uh, what you're probably seeing, there's training the message boards up there now. You see those, that's what, that's what this is all about. 
Uh, it'll take about it'll take about two months, a little less than two months to get to get it completed. Like I said, most of the work will be done at night. Um, did anybody come and enjoy the dog park and, and the Western Night Memorial uh, uh, the last uh, um, you know one piece of something out? Uh, there was a fence, the park course was closed. Um, this is a, uh, a funded project that is basically redoing the park course. Um, the, the course will be about what it is before you see all the green lines. We're keeping all the green pavement or area. We're replacing all the as asphalt pavement. Uh, the the uh, red pieces we're removing and relocating it to either to uh, keep this the slope down here a little bit uh, flatter than it, than it uh, was before uh, and also enhancing some of the, some of the views in a couple other areas and then the park horse equipment is all being replaced um, and uh, and also a new area of, of exercise equipment here right at the very entrance of the, of the park so uh, the pavement area will be done uh, probably in the next uh, just the next few weeks, and then the, followed by the park course equipment, which will probably should all be done by uh, early next year. Uh, Eaton Road, like Eaton Chase said, uh, we have uh, a dirt road, really an access way here, uh, off of Doolittle here, uh, that runs between the golf, on well, the back side of the, of the golf course uh, in Oakland and industrial areas. Uh, this project is going to construct a street uh, from, let's say, from Doolittle and run it over here to Davis Street, which gives a bypass to the Davis Doolittle intersection, which is down here in, here in the corner. Um, it's exciting in engineering, as an engineering project, as, as a built-up city. We don't get to build any new streets uh, uh, very often, so this is a, this is a this street we'll, uh, we're working on the design very diligently. The, uh, uh, you know, some of these, it's about 18, you know, 100 uh, feet, so, you know, it's, uh, and uh, we'll get a new signal at the, at Doolittle uh, uh, to, uh, you can build sidewalks, a lot of bike lanes, which will give you a, a bypass if you happen to go around through that, through that way and have to, and be able to avoid the uh, Davis Doolittle intersection. And we'll, the, the utilities will be underground, and we'll, and we'll have uh, biofilters here. The design's about 90% done. Uh, as Richard mentioned, that the funding is is really dependent on on the, uh, the assessment district formation, uh, which is sort of a lengthy process. So we're really anticipating of all that, all those things fall into place. Uh, the summer of 2013, we should be starting uh, be in a position to start starting the uh, construction of this project. Uh, with that, I'll introduce uh, Keith Cook. <coughs> Thanks, Ken. Good evening, everybody. Hey. Well, um, my name, again, is Keith Cook. I'm the principal engineer in the land use section. And uh, we'll get, get started right away. As you came in, probably, uh, uh, hopefully, I was able to give you uh, one of these sheets. Uh, talks about the um, countywide transportation plan, transportation expenditure plan. There's going to be a test on that. Um, so hopefully you've uh, read that, absorbed all that information. No, really, it's just a survey. Um, and if you haven't gotten one of these surveys, uh, make sure you pick up uh, one on the way out. But uh, hopefully you've read what the countywide transportation plan is all about. And if you haven't, it's basically our opportunity to plan the transportation projects here in the uh, Bay Area. And uh, it's it's a long, it's it's a it's a pretty involved process. There's uh, a lot of opportunities to uh, provide input. In fact, uh, one is going to be actually uh, here in town on October 19th at the Senior Community Center. And so if you'd like to um, provide some more input on you know, how transportation dollars ought to be spent here in the Bay Area, we really recommend that you, you come to that. But also, if you have this uh, um, survey, if you could take the time and fill that out, and you can leave that on the table in the back. That's another great way of providing some input on how transportation dollars will be spent in our community and in our Bay Area region. Um, there, there's also one additional portion to that, and that is, uh, you know, right now we have Measure B, which is our half cent sales tax. They're also looking for input on that new half cent sales tax measure and what projects would be important for us in San Leandro, um, if we continue 
uh, to have that um, funding source. Um, and uh, your input will allow us to find out what's important uh, to you and make sure that those types of projects are, 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 um, are, are brought forward. Now, as Kim mentioned, uh, uh, Marina, there's a lot going around there, and, and you probably noticed um, the Kaiser Hospital being built. And I'm, I'm only really talking about here uh, the Kaiser development, um, mainly just the, the all of the um, uh, public improvements that are going to be taking place. And as you can see uh, on Merced, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of red, and so that means there's a lot of construction. So over the next uh, year and a half. There's going to be a lot of construction on Merced at Merced Street. This is about Marina right here, all the way down to Fairway Drive and just past Fairway Drive. Um, we'll see a lot of construction going on there now to about the end of the year. There'll be a little break, and then coming back in the springtime, uh, the construction will pick back up <clears throat> in this area. So. Um, most of the time the construction starts about 9 o'clock or so, so um, if you want to, you know, you know, judge your timing as you drive through the area, uh, try to get there either early or um, very late, otherwise there will be some congestion there. Another big project that's going on uh, here in San Leandro is the uh, I-80 HOV project. And uh, what that does is it is basically extends the HOV lane. This is, this is the old Albertson site, the soon to be the future Kaiser site. It extends the HOV lane from uh, just uh, south of Marina all the way up to Hagenberger. And so um, that project is going to start uh, construction uh, next year, probably about September of next year. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of work that's going on in San Leandro. How we're really impacted is that uh, both uh, Davis Street, and you can kind of make this out as the Davis Street um, exit, here's Costco, and here's Home Depot and Walmart over here. Uh, Davis Street uh, interchange is going to get rebuilt. I mean, the bridge is going to be completely removed and a new bridge put in um, at this location. And then the same thing here at Marina. Um, the bridge is going to be removed and a new one uh, placed in there. And um, this is to accommodate the wider freeway, also to raise it. I don't know if, you, if you've been in San Leandro a number of times, uh, at least in the last 15 years since I've worked here and, and 10 years lived here, um, this bridge has been hit a couple times. And, and Davis has been hit a couple times as well. And so hopefully uh, with this new work, we won't have that problem uh, with the marina uh, interchange going down. But one of the things that, um, uh, and here I'll talk about what's going to happen on the Davis Street uh, area. Not only are we improving the uh, interchange here, this will be a new bridge. Um, we're also going to add an additional lane from the off-ramp to Warden. So now there will be three lanes from the off-ramp all the way to the Costco entrance. So we're hoping that will improve the uh, congestion on Davis Street and, and make this area uh, work a lot better. And uh, uh, that's part of that Measure B funds are, are helping for that portion of the work. Uh, at Marina, uh, this is where the new Kaiser Hospital is. This is uh, Marina Square shopping right now. Um, the, there will be a new bridge. And then we're going to um, improve the ramps here so that they're a little safer. And also we're going to be working on providing um, an additional entrance into the Kaiser site to try to take some of the um, traffic congestion off the Merced uh, Marina intersection. So that's what's going to go on with the HOV project. One of the things that I think is uh, pretty interesting as well, and if you, uh, on your way in, you may have noticed a couple of uh, boards out front. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to spruce up our, bit, our bridges. You know, you only do these bridges about once every 50 years. So um, we're going to take that opportunity to spruce it up just a little bit. Um, you probably got a, um, well, you may not have gotten, but in the back there, there's a little uh, a handout like that. If you take the time, uh, you can see a little information on the back. And uh, uh, let us know um, if you like what you see. 
One of the questions that we're asking, it's kind of hard to tell on this slide, but these are our various colors between black and uh, this is the kind of a brown, bronze color. And um, there is a silver and a green color. So we, we have a choice of uh, colors on our railing um, that will be uh, available. Um, and so uh, if you get a chance, take a look at that and uh, provide a little input on that. So I'm going to end up here, and then I'm going to turn this over actually to uh, Jim Kunrati, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, AC Transit, the uh, BRT project. Excuse me, can we ask some questions? Well, why don't we finish with Jim's presentation, and then we'll go through questions. That, and then that way we'll, we'll, we'll be able to spend all the time on questions. The transportation is different. The transportation Actually, lock up, lock up. Different. Let's, let's keep the form, okay? We'll do the questions afterwards. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jim Conradi. I work with AC Transit. Um, my uh, uh, specialty is working on AC Transit's bus rapid transit project, which is part of a worldwide trend to improve bus service because as you've seen roadways are a very important part of the transportation network in San Leandro. Public transit is also very important to maintain the quality of life and also to help us all create um, a sustainable future in the city. So this is a summary of sort of the problem we face as a bus agency. So we see growth, we see growth in population, jobs, and traffic. Um, more cars means more congestion, which means the buses go slower, which means fewer people ride them, which means more cars. It puts us in a bit of a vicious circle. Um, this shows sort of how AC Transit's average speed has been going for the last, um, uh, since the mid-80s. Um, we've dropped from over 14 miles an hour average to around uh, a little over 11 miles an hour average. So it's an expensive trend, meaning that we have to spend more and more to keep the same level of service. So what we're trying to do is establish um, our first bus rapid transit line on our busiest line, which is along San Lee, on um, East 14th and um, uh, International Boulevard. Um, the system is called Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT. Um, it's a technology that's being used uh, around the world. We have examples here in Cleveland and in England. It's essentially trying to get the efficiencies of a rail system, but at the lower cost and flexibility of buses. So it has some uh, features which are very prominent, and I'll talk, talk with you about those. Um, the main one are bus lanes, which are lanes for the exclusive use of buses and emergency vehicles. Um, uh, stations, which are built a little more involved than an average bus stop that allow you to roll um, directly onto the bus if you're in a wheelchair or pushing a baby stroller. Um, you pay for your fare off the bus, which if you've seen buses stop at the curb for a long period of time, often it's because people are lining up to pay the fares on the bus, and we want to eliminate that. So, uh, and the final thing is um, a higher level of technology within the traffic signals that allow the buses and signals to communicate to give them uh, more green time. So that's BRT in a, um, in a very brief uh, outline. There's very successful projects on the West Coast. We're not going to be alone in uh, developing these systems. So there's one in Eugene, Springfield, Oregon, um, which they're adding a second line now. Los Angeles, the Orange Line, they are extending that. And in Vegas, they just started um, opening their second bus ride and transit line. So this is um, International Boulevard at 82nd. Um, the width of the street is very similar to what you have in San Leandro. Um, BRT um, operates in the middle of the road. Um, if you look at the platform, the bus is pulling up on the left side. So what, what we're doing is we are purchasing buses with doors on the left and the right side, just like a rail vehicle. And they can both make stops at a, a center platform in the middle of the road. Um, we're also purchasing hybrid drive vehicles, so it's the equivalent of like a 60-foot Prius so that it gets better fuel economy and reduced emissions and quieter operations. So the, the entire system works uh, more efficiently uh, and quieter. 
So for San Leandro, the dedicated lanes and the center stations are, are in the north. So um, the dedicated lanes extend all the way from First Avenue in Oakland. They come into San Leandro and they transition away um, right, at, right south of uh, Sunnyside Drive. Um, so BRT is expected to bring a lot more riders to the system. There's already a lot on it today. There's 23,000 people that ride the one to one hour bus today. Um, it goes up uh, in the future, but when you, you look on the right-hand column with BRT, the, the ridership goes up a lot more because the, the bus, is, bus is a lot faster and it keeps a much more reliable schedule. Um, so to give you a sense of where those numbers are, about 10% of our riders live and work in San Leandro. So the project um, has a lot of benefits for the community, which I just want to highlight a few. One is we reduce pollutions and greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, mainly by reducing auto trips. So we're saving uh, gasoline um, and reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And I want to make a point that um, this does not include analysis of the new hybrid buses. So these numbers will likely look even better um, once those are included. And um, our board of directors, um, I'd like, I would like to introduce one of our uh, board members, Mark Williams, if he's still here. Um, he represents San Leandro, and we are directed to buy American-made hybrids, both to create jobs, but also to help uh, improve our fuel efficiency. Um, the project itself is about $200 million, 14 miles long, um, creates jobs both in construction and other jobs. Uh, it also is expected to attract investment into the community um, and supports transfer-oriented development, much like the plan that you've developed here locally around your, uh, the San Leandro Bar Station. So um, the investment in San Leandro will be about $10 million in infrastructure. Um, the stations themselves provide focal points for both uh, new development and neighborhood activity. Um, and the BRT is a key part of the city's TOD strategy at, at the BART station. Um, so there are some impacts to the project, but after um, working with the community, taking in input, and modifying the project accordingly, we think we've eliminated most of those to, to um, levels that would be acceptable to the community. So the, the um, largest concern expressed last year when we've, we were um, speaking before you was the um, loss of on-street parking. So we've reduced the amount of parking, partly because of the, the, the new buses, the platforms take up less room, but we've also tweaked the project here and there so that even after some parking is removed, there's still plenty of supply on the street um, to support the businesses. Um, what we're working on today are ways to address any other impacts that might happen to businesses. So we're investigating new commercial delivery zones, uh, making sure that the businesses are uh, open during um, construction, and we're going to be flexible in the way we enforce the bus lanes to allow people to um, pass double park cars and so forth. So I've been told to hurry it up. So let me tell you how you can participate. <laughs> so uh, we'll go through the bad news. The good news. Yeah, go back. That's an important issue, the slide you just passed. <laughs> they all work, but I was told to speak. So, um, so here we go. So here's the parking issue. So um, below, um, between Euclid and Oaks, we actually, that negative sign means we add parking on the street. So that's, that's a change from last time we spoke. Here is where we're focusing our efforts to, to do mitigation projects between Cambridge, Garcia, and Euclid. So right now there's 40 on-street spaces on East 14th Street. Uh, 20 of those are uh, vacant during peak usage, so it's about half occupied. We displace about 21 spaces, which could create a problem. So that's where we want to focus our mitigation efforts there on the parking issue. There's no other parking issues outside of uh, that area. Um, 
We had three traffic impacts at these three intersections, West Broadmoor, San Leandro, Bancroft, Dutton, and San Leandro and Davis. We have an impact when we build the project. We do mitigations, which are mostly just signal timing issues at Bancroft, Dutton, San Leandro, and Davis. Um, not at Broadmoor and San Leandro, because that's a stop sign. But after the mitigation, there's no longer significant traffic impacts anywhere in the city. Um, we do have some turn restrictions for some streets, and this has a positive and a negative. I want to say both. So the negative is that it can be less convenient um, for access for people. Um, the positive side is that right in, right out, sort of the use of medians is a much safer environment, easier to make. Uh, uh, well, there's less broadside accidents, um, and it's generally safer. It's, they found it to reduce accidents by up to 80 percent, so it is a trade-off between a safer environment but a little less convenience, and those are the streets that would have right-in, right-out movements or other types of uh, uh, less severe restrictions on turning. Um, so how you can get involved, I'll go four blocks over. We are in the process of producing a final environmental impact statement, um, which will be uh, available for public review in January. It incorporates the City Council's resolution of, of last year, as well as many, many uh, uh, comments and ideas that we received from the community. Uh, we, begin, we begin detailed design next year as well, and expect to have, begin construction in 2014 and operation of the entire full system by 2016. Thank you. Um, I want to be cognizant of the time, and as we were hoping to keep this to a 90 minute meeting, maybe put in a little too much contents. Um, uh, so, uh, obviously, if you wish to leave, uh, you can leave at any time. But I want to, um, we have two presentations here essentially the first on city projects and city street issues, and then this, um, the AC Transit presentation. And we still have a couple other little topics at the end. So. I'm, a, I'm basically, um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes on questions about the city transportation issues, and then let's have about five minutes or so on the AC transit, and folks can stay afterwards and talk, and then I'll finish uh, with the last two topics on the agenda. So we'll be here about 20 more minutes if you wish to stay. Um, and so let's open it up to questions now specific to city transportation issues that, that from our city folks. And let's let's have people that haven't had a chance to ask a question first to, to ask it during this period. So, hey, I have a question for Mr. Conradi, is that correct? About um, the turn restrictions on East 14th and... Is this about the BRT? The BRT okay, in, in San Leandro. Okay, we're, let's focus Let's let's do that second. Let's do the because um, I okay. Yeah, well, we have both districts here, and I want to make sure that we get you know the folks in five also get a chance to ask questions. Um, for Ken on A80 to or Davis Street, for do we see the the ramp picture to 88 North? Um, is it still there? The, the drawing didn't show it. All the ramps, uh, the interchanges remain pretty much exactly the way they are now. So all the movements that you can make now, we will be able to make uh, when the interchanges are reconstructed. Okay, another question from Mr. Cook. On uh, southbound 80, exiting to go westbound on Marina, it's a horrible off-ramp from 80 on the Marina because people come over that bridge two lanes you mentioned it, but are they going to add another lane? I don't want to spend all that money and effort and time and not have that really fixed. It needs a separate lane for that off-ramp so you can merge with westbound traffic on Marina. Right now, the plans for that, um, we don't add it necessarily another. Well, on the off-ramp, the off-ramp does get another lane, another lane. But what really makes a big difference there is that that ramp will become signalized. So um, the movements will be a little bit more controlled. So there won't be the merging issue um, uh, that we have now. Can't you add another lane, though? Even that yeah, doesn't uh, sound right. It's, uh, it, the bridge is wider. The bridge will be wider. 
but, and we have a lot of lanes. Actually, we have three approach lanes as you, you go up to, uh, to Merced. So there's, there's enough lanes there. I think controlling the, the, the flow off the freeway will make that a lot easier. Just a quick question again on the Davis Street. Um, exactly when will that uh, construction begin and will there be a lot of pounding noises at night? <laughs> the construction will start in September. Um, the, most of the, uh, the noisy operations, uh, there will be some at night because uh, the demolition of the bridge has to, will occur at night, but driving piles, that will occur during the day. It's approximately a two-year project. Okay, and will both, will the entire bridge be taken out at one time or half at a time? Half at a time. There will always be two lanes in both directions on all the bridges. Thank you. When we cross over, when we take our bicycles from San Leandro, we like to bicycle to Alameda, we have to go down Williams because it's not safe to cross Davis over 880. Will there be a bike lane that allows you to go down Davis all the way to the Ron Allen Bridge? Yes, there will be uh, bike lanes over the bridge, and there'll be wider sidewalks. Um, and it'll be a little, there'll be a bike lane to Warden, but you know, there's still some work to pull for also. Is that both directions? Yes. Great, thanks. I didn't use my privilege as the mayor to ask a follow-up. So if you're going down Davis, though, you're like, on a bike, you're worried about like, getting run over by a car that's going to get on the freeway northbound. Are, are we going to address that anyway, or is that still going to be an issue? Um, I think in our, the configuration now, it, it, it gets a little bit better, but uh, I, we still have some of those on-ramp um, issues. Okay, well, we have some further conversations. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you as Bay Area Healthy 880 Communities. Um, I'm part of Ditching Dirty Diesel, and one of the things that we are concerned about is if we add a new HOV lane, is that going to really get rid of the gridlock that we're dealing with today? That's one. I want to go back to Eden Road. Eden Road was part of a, uh, a project that's called the Eco Park down the uh, Doolittle and Davis, and the reason we fought for Eden Road to be paved is so that the trucks would take off of uh, Hagen River Road and, and they would go around and go to uh, waste management and all the different businesses that are in there. Is that how you're going to suggest that all freight trucks go on that path? That's a second. Um, we got to be conscious of a number of questions, so let's and, just leave it But in. that's why I wanted it at that time. So my concern with Davis West Neighborhood Group is that this ramp is really going to impact our quality of life. We have five schools that are in this area. We have four neighborhoods that are impacted by all these changes. Was there ever a health assessment on all the neighborhoods and the impacts that 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 this project is um, um, that you're working on, was there ever a health impact assessment to show how much is going to impact us? As you know, that San Leandro is the second highest asthma rate in Alameda County. Okay. Uh, what was the first? Well, I'll answer the second one uh, first. Um, there was an environmental document uh, prepared. Uh, this project is, uh, was, was sponsored by the Alameda County Transportation Commission and Caltrans, uh, and they did prepare an environmental document, um, and uh, they review uh, all the issues that are required um, for an environmental document. I'm talking about health assessment, not environmental. I, I don't know, but I can put you in contact with uh, Caltrans and ACTC and they can review um, the environmental documents uh, with you. I, you know that review of the congestion is in the environmental document as well because they review traffic impacts and uh, I don't have the information specifically on that but if you uh, want to review that I can make sure I can put you in contact with the 
with the, um, the person that provide, prepared the environmental document and they can review that data with you. Let's have a final question related to Sandy and I would, I would like to know while you are working on, well, two questions, on new bridges, we you have wider sidewalk, you try to walk over Davis Street to go to Walmart on foot. You could get, most people could get a panic attack, and I thought I was the only one. Now, can you have wider sidewalk and make it seem like you're safe instead of looking over at one side, you're looking down at the freeway, and then and to the other side, you're out in the street and the trucks and cars are coming by. I think How you're going to feel... Taken I think you're going to feel more comfortable on these uh, new bridges. There's going to be a bike lane, so there'll be a little bit more of a buffer. The sidewalks are wider. Uh, the crossings are going to have better visibility. So for a pedestrian as a bicyclist, um, the bridges are going to be uh, an immeasurable improvement over what we have right now. Do you uh, going to give people plenty of time direction that when you work on one bridge, you tell them how to get around the city to say, I live close to Walmart. If I can't get to Walmart, then I can go around the other way and the back way to get to Walmart while you're working on one of the bridges? There's going to be a, an extensive traffic management plan and there'll be a, a, there's a lot of outreach plan for dealing with the um, uh, variety of uh, detours that will be needed for the project. All right. Thank you. Okay, I, I have one uh, couple of questions. One I, excuse is, me, excuse me. That, that was our last question on the city. I got to be. What the, the, the folks, the folks will be here afterwards too. I just want to be cognizant of everyone's time. I want to open it up for five minutes for questions related to the AEC transit yeah, presentation. And if that's, if you have one on that, yes. go right ahead. Okay, Boston, AC Transit. Years ago, we had a bus that went down Davis Street to South Line, and it took the freeway. Now you've got so many cars. How are you going to take care of people if you have buses in the middle of the street who is blind, in wheelchairs, cars cutting you off, and only two bicycles in front of the bus? and you turn off the bus at 7 o'clock in the afternoon. In the evening. And then 5 o'clock you start the bus up. And then you have these certain buses that won't even come to your place, who is disability, say, well, as long as you could walk, you should go to the bus stop. Okay, so um, BRT does try, I can't talk about all bus stops, most bus stops are pretty much out of our control. The BRT stops have a lot of features that are meant for people with limited mobility or disability. So that is in there's... The downtown. That is in the main downtown. I thought this was off of downtown on Davis Street. Go back to some of the old blueprints where they have the buses used to run and shut the buses that used to go across the go and get the Bay Bridge. Then you find out you've got a track right down in Oakland that hit Bancroft. So I'll say what we're doing in terms of persons with disabilities access safety, because I think that's the heart of your question is so, so far as I can answer it. So the BRT stations have a level platform so that people can walk directly from the bus and the platform without a step. So you can roll on, if you're in a wheelchair, if you walk, there's no step. Um, they're lit. Um, we also add lighting, and this is, this is different than what you see on the street. Most street lighting is to light up the street for motorists. But people who are walking and taking the bus, we put lighting on the sidewalks, we put it illuminating the crosswalks, and we illuminate the station. Um, there are tactile strips for the visually impaired. We also you have Braille. Um, on fair vending machines and other things. We also have safety features such as closed circuit television cameras and emergency phones so people feel safe. And it's something we can't provide at every bus stop, but for the BRT system we do provide that. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, I had a question regarding the 
restrictions on turning. And um, I know that in my neighborhood up in, right on where it comes in on East 14th Street, the neighbors who live there up on Euclid and Garcia have discussed a lot how they really have difficulty accessing their streets with this. It's not so much the restriction that they can just only turn one direction when they go out, like they can only turn north and then they have to, it's a long way for them to end up going to get around and turn south. But then in order to come back to their homes, they can't even turn onto their streets. So, I mean, what kind of mitigations can be put in place to, um, you know, is there any hope or help for the people who live on these streets? Well, there is a, what, what people typically do, so this is the inconvenient side of having right in, right out things at uh, uh, streets. So, um, people could, you, we're adding traffic signals so that people can have more access points in and out of the neighborhood so that we're trying to minimize their out of distance travel to like a block. So that we, we add signals, we add other opportunities um, for access into the neighborhood for those streets that become right in, right out. The advantage to right in, right out from a traffic safety perspective is that one of the biggest problems, less so in San Leandro, but it's a major problem in Oakland, are broadside accidents of people making left turns across multiple lanes of traffic. And in that case, the right in, right out is a huge safety improvement. Um, it'll be a similar improvement here in San Leandro, but we, our goal is to keep that inconvenience factor, that out of direction travel or a block out of your way to the minimum. I think we've accomplished it, but I won't um, say that we couldn't have missed something or could do it better. So we're still, you know, we're open to hearing kind of what the access issues are, um, especially um, uh, for people who live in the neighborhood and have a detailed knowledge of how um, circulation is done throughout the neighborhoods. So you. just in a follow-up to that is, why is it that it's only coming such a short way into San Leandro and only then affecting those few streets at the north? Why isn't the BRT going farther, like all the way down East 14th Street, down to Bayfair Mall? So th this has to do with the decision-making in the city. Um, we had originally proposed it to go all the way down to Bayfair Mall. Um, in downtown, there was never a proposal for dedicated lanes at any point because of the street's too narrow um, and it's too congested. So we knew we had to end it somewhere. But the extent of dedicated lanes are quite, it is quite extensive. They go all the way to Lake Merritt. There's dedicated lanes um, in Oakland's plan for the entire way. It's just that it, we have to end somewhere north of Davis. So we picked a place where the transition was easy and safe to do. A uh, question on the hybrid part of that engines on your buses. What's the other part? Is it diesel? It's. We it's, say no. Well, diesel we is the dirtiest fuel to burn. There's natural gas hybrid, and now there's a company in Cincinnati making straight ethanol, no gasoline, hybrid engines for locomotives. They can do the same thing for buses. And diesel, I grant you, is clean when the engine's new. But as soon as they get a few miles on and there's not perfect maintenance, they're just spewing out black clouds of dust, and we don't like that. And it's, you're going to spend so much money on this for a new system. Please use natural gas hybrids or ethanol hybrids. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Well, first of all, Jim, welcome to San Leandro, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I represent um, my own street, Georgia Way, um, in District 5, and also um, some 3,600 people that uh, the city of San Leandro had to notify about some recent uh, traffic changes that were made to the configuration of, uh, particularly to the northbound traffic on East 14th. Um, I understand the uh, process, and you know we're figuring $14 million uh, per mile um, for the track. The, I question the value added for the four blocks in San Leandro that are impacted, particularly because it does not terminate at a shopping center or another transit-oriented uh, stop, like a BART station. It would have made a great deal of sense to take it along San Leandro Boulevard and end at the BART station. But my question to you, Jim, is very simple. Um, have, have you visited 
um, the north area of our town during the peak hours? Um, have you ever walked your child across East 14th Street? Um, it just seems that um, the, the benefit of having the BRT on these four blocks, the environmental benefits that you propose, the, um, uh, the, the greater good, is outweighed by the fact that I now have to idle my car to get out and avoid North Area. The, the impact that I'm now avoiding the downtown to do my shopping. So, Jim, have, has the staff really been in the neighborhood on a Saturday morning? Um, ha, have, you, have you tried to get your kid to school or have you tried to go to work as it is now? And, and, and my question is particularly is, um, do you think that that is mitigatable? Or can, you, can we really solve those problems? So the, the, the street layout plan for the traffic lanes for BRT is exactly what the city has. So there's no change in that or in capacity. So there shouldn't be any additional idling. There's no traffic impacts within the uh, city. So for safety, there's a couple issues. So we recognize this. So I, no, I haven't been, I don't live in San Leandro, so I haven't walked my kids to school, but I have tried to cross the street, and it's very difficult, mainly because people don't yield. But there's, if you add traffic signals, as well as the ability for pedestrians to activate those signals, you have, um, it becomes a, safe, a safer street. Um, so that's, I guess, the, the short answer to a provocative question. <laughs> okay, last question on this topic. Hi, can you hear me? My father picked buses for 30 years so I could ride them for 40. I'm for AC Transit. However, I think this is just a big PR thing about the platforms making it easier. You're not going to gain that much mileage um, speed. The parallel is from BART to East 14th Street. You've had for 100 years that is a business district in Oakland where they have to make their deliveries in front of their businesses on East 14th Street, not behind. You're not going to gain that much from all this money that you're spending. If you would change your route so that they could be to one half mile increments, so that you were not only competing with, but you were also making increments to BART. BART is like Pershing and East 14th Street. It runs a mile um, parallel to East 14th Street, but it's used to get off the, the main road of stuff. But you've been at this for years, and you've been promising. I used to be in the workplace. I gave up having a job because of the, bar, the bus system. The, you had the one, the one R's, and then where I live, on Bristol Boulevard, I've got food max across the street three blocks from me. That saves a whole lot of stuff, but it's like you don't really know that it even exists. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jen. Um, and there's certainly going to be further community discussions with respect to the proposed BRT. Obviously, once the environmental impact report is done, we'll all keenly take a look at that. Um, you know, it actually, Jim was pointing out that we have a uh, flyer here which um, asks some sort of questions about our city, uh, just real basic questions, and also room for um, you to you know tell us any. Um, comments that you have that you want us to take a look at later. I really appreciate everyone being here. We're almost on two hours, which is longer than what I normally, we, we try to keep these to 90 minutes. So in that sense, I apologize for putting more content in here than you know we uh, try to do. I, uh, this will be an annual event, certainly. Um, and I just, we had two other items on the agenda. I want to be very, to talk about them very briefly. The first one was the city budget. The good news is the city is in the black this year. We're not deficit spending. Um, the bad news is that um, our expenses are projected to go up and our revenues are not projected to go up at, in the same um, percentage as our expenses. So our five-year projection shows us going back into the red come next year. Um, now these projections do get regularly revised, and they're going to be substantially revised at the beginning of 2012 when we get the sales tax data from the very end of 2011. Hopefully it will be more positive. But what it means is that we still have difficult decisions ahead of us. Um, 
it, the city has made many difficult decisions. The staff is down by 20%. Uh, there's been a number of sacrifices that city employees have made. Um, but uh, we, the city also dipped into the reserves extensively um, while it was deficit spending. That is not occurring now, but it does mean that those reserves, which were a substantial number several years ago, are now down um, to you know, about $5 million or so. So we don't have the luxury of dipping into reserves in the future should the city finances um, or should the city start to run operating deficits again. Um, that's sort of like you know the 60-second summary. Um, positive today, serious warning signs down the road, and we're committed to addressing them. And, and um, I chair the finance committee, and um, you know it's just we're aware of this, and we. we invite the community to be participate in our budget decisions. Um, essentially, with this year's budget, it was the same as last year's. Um, there were no new programs. We couldn't, you know, there was no money for new programs, with two minor exceptions. One of which is, though, uh, we put some more money into disaster preparedness that wasn't there previously, and um, and to have some disaster training courses for our community because we felt that that was crucially important. But other things such as you know hiring more police officers, expanding the library of hours, expanding our pool hours, it's just not part of the budget right now. And I don't know when that will turn around because um, we have to have a sound fiscal. We, we have to get to a sustainable fiscal plan or level before we can talk about expanding current programs. You know, until we can start projecting um, a balanced budget in the next few years, it's not realistic to have additional programs or an expansion of current programs. Um, and then the last, the other thing I want to mention is that on October 13th and the 19th, there's a yellow flyer, green flyer, <laughs> in the back, and we're going to have more community meetings. Um, so I hope we haven't turned you off to all community meetings. Um, but this one will be, uh, these are citywide, anyone can come. There were two different locations. And they'll be on our redistricting of city council districts. And also, uh, we're in the process of recruiting a new permanent city manager, and we'd like to get community input on that process. In terms of redistricting, you know, every 10 years, there's the federal census. Well, then that also impacts us on the local level. We want it, we have six council districts. We want them to be roughly of the same size in terms of population. And of course, over 10 years, populate, you know, the population within each district shifts a little bit. And to get them back close to all being even, we have to change the districts a little bit. We will unveil the plan that's been proposed. I think actually most people will be supportive of it because the changes really are not that large, although it does affect um, District um, uh, 5. Um, so basically, District 5 got more people and District um, 1 got less. And so District 5 is going to shrink a little bit and some of the folks that are in um, Five are shifting over to one. Now, the reality in San Leandro is everybody gets to vote for each member that's running for city council. So in that sense, it doesn't, you can argue that it doesn't really matter because you still get to vote for everybody. But your district representative may shift depending upon exactly where you live. But again, we have to do this because under our charter, we have to try to keep our districts all roughly the same size. Okay, so that's it. I want to conclude the meeting because we're at basically 8.30. But I'm here, Pauline's here, Jim's here. If you have questions that you want to pose to us, feel free to come up and ask us right now. Thank you very much for coming.